The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm your host, Stephanie Passingham. It is finally spring, and we're going to be doing some spring chores on today's show. We meet up with Rick Plagenkuhl to learn about how to prune our plants in the spring, not only for good shape, but also good health and growth. Andrew Pruitt joins us in the studio to teach us about a great garden helper, honeybees, how to keep a hive in your backyard and all the tasty goodies that come with it. And speaking of tasty goodies, Chef Larson will have another great recipe for us, this time with Belgian endive. I hope you'll stay with us for Garden Connections. Welcome to Garden Connections. We are going to talk first today about honey. And as you can see, we have this lovely demonstration hive that we're going to learn more about. And Andrew Pruitt is here from Honeymoon Honeybees. And he's going to tell us all about how to take care of them and what you might do to have a hive in your backyard. Welcome to the program, Andrew. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Yep. So how long have you been involved in raising honeybees? I've been involved for five years. I've been reading about them for seven, and uh, I've learned an enormous amount in that time. Wow. That's it's a real passion. It's a real passion. What do you love most about honeybees? Uh, for me, it's working with the bees. The more I work with the bees, the more I feel in touch with, my, I guess, my inner self. <laughs> okay. Right. You were talking earlier, it's almost meditative. To work it is. With them. You it's get really it's very calm much. Um, you have to pay attention to them, and you forget about what it is that was bothering you 20 minutes ago. Right, gone. yeah. You, yeah. you focus, and you lose track of the stress of the day. Um, wow. And if you do something wrong, the bees let you know, and, mm -hmm. and you've got to pay even more attention. <laughs> you know, that is, you talk about relaxation and losing the stress of the day. Bees sometimes are a creature that many people fear. There's a huge fear of, uh, of honeybees, and I deal with that uh, quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. I can remember one instance where I was working with my bees, and I came around the side of the house, and I had my bee suit on, and one of the teenagers from the area was happened to be in the driveway, and he's like, oh my god, that's not scary at all. <laughs> So, yeah, um, bees, there's a, a large fear of bees because there is, you know, the potential for an anaphylactic reaction, mm -hmm. and it so hurts. people are highly allergic. Yeah. Okay. And, if, and you, if you get stung, it hurts. And if you're not expecting it, it, it hurts even more. <laughs> That's a surprise. Let's look at this hive a little bit. You built this wonderful demonstration hive so we can see what happens inside. So kind of explain the parts to it, to this sure. hive. I'm assuming this is kind of honeycomb area. Yeah in here. I'll, I'll let you point those out and I think maybe we can even see the queen in here We, we might be able to see the queen. She's definitely in here. What we have in this observation hive is a representation of what you would have in a normal beehive um, divided by 10. So you have a single uh, deep frame here and you would have 10 frames in each deep of your beehive mm -hmm. and those frames whatever the bees do in those frames that's for the bees that's their honey for that's their food their honey their that's space. their pollen it's it's where they have their eggs their brood it's mm -hmm. where they do all the things that bees need to do to live can we identify the queen in here the at all, queen is right here and she's cleaning her abdomen uh, oh, you can see yep. her she's the big long uh, organism there yep. And uh, if we're lucky, she'll stick her abdomen down in the hole, and you see all these bees around her that are facing her. Mm -hmm. We call those attendant bees. Oh, and they okay. are uh, connecting with her with their antenna and their feet, maybe, and mm -hmm. uh, definitely their proboscis. And she is releasing pheromones. And those pheromones are telling these bees what she wants them to know, which is that she's there, mm -hmm. they need to remain calm, and that they can uh, go on doing their work. And each one of those bees will then leave her, and they'll touch another bee, and mm -hmm. they'll touch another bee, and they spread that pheromone around the hive. Mm -hmm. When the queen is not present, those pheromones are gone, and the bees become anxious, they know there's a problem, and that's one of the keys that they can, that will trigger them to begin raising new queens. Well, in a minute, we are going to put together kind of the samples of how the hive would come together, but right now, we are going to take a look at spring pruning with Rick Plagenkohl. Let's check it out. Well, today it's cold, it's windy, and it snowed in many parts of our region last night. Not exactly a day in which you might be thinking about gardening. But early spring is an important time for many plants in the garden. Today we're at one of my favorite gardens, the Central Gardens of North Iowa. 
We're here and we're going to meet with Rick Plagenkohl. He's with the Cerro County Extension Service and he's going to be talking to us about pruning. He's going to talk about which plants to prune, when to prune them, and how to do so. So we're bundled up, we're going to head inside. Hello. Happy spring. Happy spring to you too. I think anyway. Yes, that's right. <laughs> At least that's what the calendar tells yeah, us. Yeah, it's a little, little chilly today. A little bit. But springtime is a great time to do some work in the garden uh, and you're going to teach us about pruning today. Yeah, I sure can. I can teach you some different pruning techniques and what plants to prune at what time of year. All right, sounds good. So some in the fall and some in the spring. What, what's the difference between the two? Yeah, again, the vast majority of the plants you're going to want to prune in the spring. Most of the flowering shrubs, your shade trees, and even your evergreens you can prune in the spring. There are a few things you can prune in the fall, but the vast majority you want to wait till late winter, early spring, probably late February to early April is the prime time to prune most of these plants. Okay. Now, do we follow the calendar or do we follow the weather? Because we're having, you know, last year it was a very mm -hmm. early, warm spring. This year, the exact opposite. Yeah, it sure is. Most of the time you want to go by the calendar. Last year when it did warm up and things started to come out a little earlier than normal, that's when maybe you want to cut off your pruning. But otherwise, I'd still go by the calendar for most situations. Okay. Is it harmful to the plant if you prune them too early, if it's still too cold? No, not really. Uh, the, the biggest thing, the reason why you want to prune them a little bit later, late February and into March and April, is just because the plant's going to start growing very soon and it's going to seal over that wound that you created a lot quicker. Okay, all right, and so then there's no chance of disease or anything? Yeah, it really out. lessens the chance of getting diseases or insect pressure or things like that But if you prune them a little later. Okay, and there are different styles of pruning for different plants. We're going to look at several today. Yes. Right here we've got a couple of different kinds of hydrangea that mm -hmm. you've picked out. So tell us a little bit about what we're going to do for these plants here. We've got, what's this one here? Yeah, this is a hydrangea. This is probably an Annabelle hydrangea. I don't have a tag on it, but an Annabelle hydrangea is a smooth uh, hydrangea. And these can be cut back pretty much to the ground like what you see here. Okay. It's, uh, it's, you can treat them like a perennial. They flower during the summer. So what they'll do is they'll put on all this new growth and flower in the same year. And so these, basically, they kind of die back to the ground. There's not much. Nothing will come out of these. No, nothing's going to come then. out of there. They will come out of towards the base of the plant is where you'll start seeing the buds for the new year. Okay. So when you prune them, hydrangea especially, you want to make sure you know what variety you have before you start before cutting you into start. it. Yes. And what tool are you using to do this kind of pruning? Uh, this is a hand pruner and uh, it's a bypass pruner and they work really well for pruning. What does and, that mean, a bypass well, pruner? Well, it means that you have a thin blade that passes a little thicker blade. And when you have this, it's uh, you get a little better cut, a uh, smoother cut than you would nice if you have clean. a yeah, if you have a pruner. The anvil pruner is a little different. It kind of pushes it and bunches out the plant and you don't get a real good cut so oftentimes the, the bypass pruners work a little better just simply because of the shape of the cut that you're going to have when you're finished. So, so how do plants, we know which branch to pick? Well oftentimes with like this hydrangea here you just kind of come back to a spot where you see where you see a branching and you pick a branch that is at least half the size as the one that you're cutting back. So like okay. that one there you can cut that off. Oh so it's still green in there is that what you want? Yes, it means that the plant's uh, alive and, and uh, so that's exactly what you want to look for when you're uh, cutting off your plant. Okay, and we can see where the buds will come out, but they haven't quite come yet, so, yeah. so we're not too early. Yep, yeah, you're not too early yet. When they start to really swell and get large on you, then that's when you maybe want to consider cutting off or not doing your pruning and, and uh, moving on to something else in the garden. Well, you're going to show us some other examples in other parts of the garden. Let's yes. go check them out. Okay, sounds good. We've got some beautiful dogwood over here. Yeah, I love sure this. Do. It looks so pretty in the winter, you know, when oh. everything's blah and gray. This is bright red. Yeah, it sure does. That's why it's a good thing to maybe leave something like these red twig dogwood standing all winter long because you get the snow underneath of it and you got the bright red really shows all winter. Yep, really, really pretty. So let's look at this one. And so when we were seeing bark, we're looking at something like this here. Yeah, yep, as you can see, these are probably the older stems down in here. And those are one branches that are probably at least three years old. Here you can really see a lot of bark on this oh, one sure. here. Yep. And with the rejuvenated pruning, what that's going to do is that's going to help maintain the height and the vigor of the plant. Okay. And uh, it'll also open it up a little bit, especially if you have a plant 
like some roses that tend to get a lot of diseases. Um, opening up the plant will help get air movement in there and they'll have a lot less disease problems with certain varieties. Okay, and when you do this, do you cut them way at the bottom or just where the bark part ends? Nope, you can cut them way towards the bottom, so you can kind of pull it back and cut them like that there. And like I said, you want to come in through the plant and take out about a third of the oldest branches that are in here. And a lopper is like what I'm having here. It works really good for branches that are up to about two inches uh, in size, so it makes it real easy to prune. It gives you a little bit of leverage. This one, is that right? Yep. yep. Now here is a crab apple tree, and these are among my most favorite because they seem to be the signal of spring, and, and their blossoms yes. look so beautiful. You're going to show us a couple things on this particular tree, mm -hmm. and we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, and here you can kind of see there's some uh, suckers. You get a lot of suckers on crab apple trees and even apple trees, and uh, so you get a lot of this unwanted growth is basically what it is. So what you want to do is you can clean cut these off I don't have my loppers here but you can cut these off pretty much any time of the year you don't really have to be too worried about about when you take them off it's not going to damage the tree or do any problem to it so you want to come in and take them off as low as you can yeah and we're working around this wire mesh what's the wire mesh for right well the wire mesh oftentimes it'll help to keep the rabbits off the trunk during the winter months, because uh, rabbits tend to like crab apple. It's one of their favorite plants. One of their favorite ones. And that brings up another thing is make sure that they're always loose around the trunk. If right. they start getting a little tight, Too you can tight. start girdling the tree. So, okay. but that's the main reason why they have them out here is just to keep the rabbits off. And I guess one thing you always want to consider about these is make sure they're tall enough so that when you, when you have snow, that the rabbits don't get above it right, and start chewing on, on uh, the other parts of the tree. Okay, and so you just remove all these suckers off at the base because yes. it's just wasted energy, right? Yeah, sure, it's just wasted energy and it's, it's, uh, it's no use to the tree. All right, let's go up. What's okay. a water sprout? Water sprout is basically a sucker and uh, you, you'll see a few up in here. We have one right here. It's just kind of, again, it's unwanted growth. It's just going straight up into the canopy that's crossing a lot of different branches. Okay. So you can just kind of come through, and anytime you see that branching, that goes straight Does up in the air. this guy count? Yep, I think you can probably take both, both of those of out, okay. actually. And just kind of clean up the tree. There we go. And uh, some trees, you get quite a bit of that water sprout and uh, suckers coming on it. So, but especially the water sprouts, kind of keep them to a minimum. And like I said, just a lot of unwanted growth on the tree. Okay. The other thing that you look for on actually trees of any kind are branches that cross. Is that right? Yes, that's right. We've got right. a few in here of, uh, like yeah, that. Yeah, if you kind of take a look, uh, right here we have one that's kind of crossing and it's going to end up rubbing. So you just come back and simply remove that branch. You have another one up here where you can kind of see it's, yep, it's rubbing. You can see some marks on the branches. And it depends on how far you want to go back. You can come back down into here and remove that if you'd like and then you'd still have a branch that's going to kind of fill in there. Right, you so you don't, don't have a bare spot. Yeah, but it's not going to be crossing up there and uh, infecting the branches, that's okay. correct. And again, just take a look at your branch and as long as your buds aren't filled out, you know, because these are an early, early yeah, bloomer. Yeah, early bloomer, they sure are. Okay. And yeah, the buds are still real tight on it, so you're, you're good so to you're prune good for right to go. now. All right. Rick, we've learned so much about pruning from you today. Thanks so much for sharing. You Thank you. All right. Well, we are back in the studio where it is a little bit warmer and we are talking bees and Andrew is going to show us the components of the beehive. We're going to talk about how you might put one of these together for your own backyard. And so we'll start out with the bottom, which is about how big? Oh, oh gosh. That 18 by you know, yeah, 24? 18 by, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Okay. So we can put that so back these in, go there. in here. When you have five of these filled, one, two, three, four, five, uh, then you can think about adding a second deep and then when you have five of those filled, so you've got 10 total frames, you can add a third deep. X the bees. And the bees come in through the bottom. Oh, here's their little landing pad. All right, yep, exactly. sounds good. You just take it out. Just right. take it out? Yep. Okay, all right. And then the next piece is... So we're gonna move that over here. The your next piece we put on deep. top. This goes on top. Um, and this is, these are the larger ones that you mentioned are for the bees. Correct. This is what this is their home. This is and the stuff that you see inside here is the furniture. What we call the furniture of the hive. So these are frames, deep frames, uh, for the brood and whatever else the the bees need to do. Um, this one here. So 
if I pull this one out, this is what the bees are living on. And the, the discoloration tells you the pattern that they're building on. This is where the bees would be. This is where the honey would be and the pollen. Um, and then just go ahead and set that off to the side. Okay. If you're going to go chemical free, you need to have a drone comb like this. And this is part of an integrated pest management strategy. And if we hold these two next to each other, so you can see that the, the holes here, the comb here, is smaller than the comb oh, here. Yes. This is where the male bees are raised and where they will die. <laughs> uh, this is a, uh, And how do they know it's different? Well, they made it. Um, they did this themselves, and they did it because I asked them to by putting this particular green um, drone comb in, which has an imprint of a larger comb, which is what they will build the drone comb okay. out of. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you give so them a little encouragement. I do, yes, okay. and you have to. The bees will not do what you want them to do without you asking. Okay. So we can put that so back in there. these go in here. When you have five of these filled, one, two, three, four, five, uh, then you can think about adding a second deep, and then when you have five of those filled, so you've got ten total frames, you can add a third deep. So we've got a couple more parts to go on here. Once you have filled your deeps with bees, you are ready for your supers. This is the part for us. This is the part <laughs> for us. The bees are working for us uh, entirely here. Okay, these are the shorter ones. Yep, they're, they're called uh, supers or shallows, and the honeycomb, which is right here, you can see it, they'll draw that out. It takes eight pounds of honey to make one pound of wax. So if you're doing bee economics, your first year of beekeeping is going to be very uh, expensive for the bees. They're not going to make a lot of honey. Mm -hmm. It's your second year of beekeeping That's and third and fourth yep. and so on yep. that you have uh, the production The production of, part. Of and to get this out, you have a tool here, some kind of a scraper tool yep. that will... This allow. is a decapping tool. And you just, and I won't do it here, but you rake it across and it cuts the cappings off of the honey because you can't get to the honey. This is actually plastic coated in beeswax so that we can uh, have strength to put this in a centrifuge and spin that honey out. Okay. Uh, and then it runs so down. So you just break it open it. and spin it out. Exactly. All right, great. Yep. All right, what's our next layer here? So you've got your, uh, your super there, and then you've got a dual purpose inner cover. So this inner cover in the summertime sits like so on the hive and this hole is covered so that the bees aren't going in and out and all it is is a place for them to, uh, bees like to do something called uh, propolize the hive and propolis is a, um, it's kind of like an antibiotic that the bees create out of plant immune mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. and they glue with it, it also acts as a glue and they, they do that to this and I can't get my beehive open if I don't have this inner cover in there. Uh, okay. They glue the hive cover down. A little protection, so, they don't want you in there. It, well, exactly. <laughs> and uh, in the winter time, you put it on this way so that the bees have an entrance that is out of the snow. Okay. So this goes on top of the hive here, like just so. like so. Great. And then you have your telescoping top cover, which has got the protective metal on here okay. uh, so that the bees will er, be protected from the elements. This is a great, um, you know, if it hails or snows or whatever, yeah. uh, you keep you know, the water off the bees. Right. And this goes on top, like so. And then you put a big rock on it. <laughs> put a big rock. Because yeah. who's going to come mess with your, with your hive? It you depends on where you live, but uh, for the most part, it's the wind. Uh, oh. yeah, the wind will blow the top <clears throat> off. Uh, yep. We have the straight line winds in Minnesota that mm -hmm. can be problematic. Yes, uh, right. If you're further north, you have issues of bears. And mm -hmm. uh, though a rock isn't going to keep a bear right. out, uh, at least you'll know if something has investigated. Yep. Uh, yep. They'll, they might knock the top off or, or whatnot, the, the rock. Um, I've had deer come up and knock the rock off. Really, there isn't an animal around here that's going to cause us any trouble. Not too much trouble. It's primarily yeah, the wind. It's, it's, yeah, it's the wind. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's all bad news. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about good news, which is the honey that you'll find in these hives. But next, we're going to take a visit to Chef Stephen Larson at the Quarter Quarter Restaurant, and he's going to teach us about a great recipe with Belgian endive.
Hi, I'm Chef Steven Larson. Welcome to my kitchen at Quarter Quarter Restaurant in Harmina, Minnesota. Today's recipe is going to be dealing with Belgian endive. And Belgian endive is uh, in the chicory family. You see this often used for uh, salads, but we're going to braise it today and use it as a vegetable. These I have cleaned already, but what you have to do is take a look at the outsides and make sure and take off any uh, leaves that are slightly damaged. And we also want to trim this root a bit as well, because then we've got them ready to go. Uh, it also comes in a red variety, like this one here. Uh, we'll use that maybe later for something else. Once we have the outer leaves off, we also need to cut them down the middle. And then we'll just pop them right in the pan like that. Then we also need some minced fresh shallot. So we're just going to cut that real quick. About a tablespoon of that. A bit of sugar, about a half a teaspoon, and also a bit of kosher salt for seasoning. Now the liquid we're going to cook this in is uh, vegetable stock, which I have here. And we'll pop that on the stove, bring that to a boil. Make sure that the shallot and the seasoning is down in the stock. I'm going to let that cook for about five minutes or so. Uh, we'll turn these once until most of the liquid is evaporated. We're going to finish this with some Meyer lemon. Now Meyer lemon is a cross between a uh, regular lemon and a mandarin orange. So it has a bit more of a sweetness to it, but they're also really fragrant and really delicious. So we use that for a little bit of acid and then we're going to finish with some walnut oil and a sprinkling of toasted chopped walnuts. So now that these are done, we're going to shut them off and bring them over to the table here. And we'll arrange them on our plate. And then we'll finish the sauce. And for that, we'll need the juice of half a lemon, which is going to be about a tablespoon and a half. I want to get those seeds out of there. And we'll finish it up with just a few tablespoons of walnut oil. Okay, and we shake that around in the pan to make our dressing. And then over the top it goes. And then for the final touch, we'll put on our toasted walnuts. Just a sprinkling down the middle. And to make the plate look really pretty, we'll put some more of that Meyer lemon around the outside. So there's the dish, braised Belgian endive, because there's nothing better than eating fresh from your garden. Well, Chef Larson always gives us a great recipe and always makes me hungry. And we are talking about honeybees with Andrew Pruitt here today. And honey is one of my favorite things that comes out of a hive. Not the only thing, but let's start with the honey. And 
where can you find honey that you know is produced, say, in your neighborhood or in your area? How do you find a honeybee guy to get local honey from? Well, you ask around, you know, does somebody know somebody? And usually they do. There are a large number of beekeepers in the area, uh, in Minnesota especially, we're the eighth largest honey producing state in the country. Wow, okay. So, yeah. Um, so there's bound to be someone. Absolutely. And if you know the person, you're, you're going to get high quality honey. It's mm -hmm. going to have the all of the, the health benefits that you're looking for. The closer to your home you can get it, the better. What I usually tell people is if you know and that the honey was produced within 200 miles of your home, it will have the pollens and the allergens in it that you're looking to expose yourself mm -hmm. to to develop a resistance over time and to mm -hmm. reduce your allergy, allergic reactions yes. to whatever you might have. Great health benefits mm -hmm. to honey yep. as well. So perhaps a little bit different than what you might find in the grocery store depending on where you shop. Yes, you need to look at the label. You know, where was it produced? Mm -hmm. Where was it packaged? Because uh, they could be two different things and if they don't tell you, that should be a red flag. Okay, look for somebody like Andrew. All right, other things that can come out of a hive, and you actually use a lot of products. Uh, we do create a lot of products yeah. from what comes out of the hive. Yep, uh, you can get pollen, you can do uh, lip balms, you can do skin creams. We do both of those. Uh, you can do fire starters, you can do candles, loads of candles. All kinds of stuff. Yep. Yeah, great. Well, Andrew, thank you so much you. for exposing us to the world of honeybees. We won't be afraid anymore. You can hardly hear these guys anymore. When they first came in, they were buzzing like oh, crazy, yeah. and they're very relaxed now. So yeah. they get calm when you leave them alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Terrific. Well, thanks again. And thank you for joining us here on Garden Connections. We look forward to seeing you next time. On Garden Connections, we'd love to see photos of your garden. Or if you have questions for our garden experts, contact us by emailing garden at ksmq.org or like us on Facebook.